All right, so in this video, what I'm going to do is explain to normal people what Ethereum is and, and more broadly, actually, what blockchain technologies are. So Bitcoin and Ethereum are the primary ones, okay? So in order to understand what these are, first what we have to do is understand how the current system of the internet works. And it works a bit like this. So you have a server. I'm actually going to go on this side. Okay, so you have a server where uh, what we call the clients, so it could be your iPhone, could be your computer, maybe a laptop or a desktop. What they do is they upload something, maybe it's an image or maybe it's a rating for a restaurant or whatever. They upload it to a server which is owned by a company. Let's call it Facebook or Yelp or Twitter or whatever. So you upload an image, it goes to this server, and then it's stored on the server. Okay, and a server is really, it's just another computer, except it's fancier, has backup power supply, it has backups of the information and all this stuff. But at its core, it's just a computer. And so when you upload an image to a, a web service, what they're doing, you're just like giving them a picture and it's, it's under their control, okay? It's on their, their server. And so when other people say, hey, I wanna see that picture, they make a request and it's delivered to them on the computer, okay? But it's all centralized. And this is the important point to note, is that it's controlled on this computer called a server. And this is how the current system works. And it's got us very far. And in fact, this is how the banking system works. So if you think about it, with a bank, you have central server, which is at the bank. Hold on, it's going out. Okay, uh, it's at the bank, and they have a database with a ledger on it. Okay, and a ledger is just a key, which is your name, and then a value, which is your bank balance, and a you know, copy of all your transaction history. So this is stored on the bank's server. And then you have, uh, let's say an ATM. An ATM or maybe one of the checkout registers at the supermarket. Okay, and you go with your credit card and it makes a request to this centralized database and says, you know, do you have the balance? Yes, you do, okay, approved, boom. And then same thing with your ATM, it's all the same. Okay, so it's the same exact structure. Now this structure, again, it works. It's brought us pretty far, but it has some fundamental flaws. And the fundamental flaw is that whoever controls the server has an inordinate amount of power, meaning that in a bank, they can freeze your account. In fact, since you deposit your money in the bank, they actually lend out most of the money. So if everybody went to the bank at the same time, and we have what's called a bank run, they wouldn't be able to give everybody their money because they don't actually have it in the bank. They've lent it out to other people. Um, and another thing is that the bank has a copy of all your transaction history. So they know like where you are, because if you travel to a different country and you use a credit card, they know that you're in that country. And so they have all this information about you. And of course, we don't even have to go into what the internet companies have about you, right? All sorts of information. So... In 2008, during the financial crisis, somebody said, you know what, what if we designed a currency that didn't need this middleman? What if we could just get rid of this person? Okay, and that's exactly what they did. So they invented something called Bitcoin. So the way that Bitcoin works is it takes out the middleman in the bank thing, and instead of having the ledger of everybody's name and their balance, instead of having that residing on a centralized server, what it does is it distributes a copy of that all throughout the network. So instead of one copy, you have literally thousands of copies of that ledger. Okay? And as a client, it won't be... Well, in the future it will. Actually, there are Bitcoin ATMs. So it could be a Bitcoin ATM or it could just be your cell phone. Okay, and another person's cell phone or computer. And if you want to make a transaction to that person, 
then you submit this transaction request to the network that's owned by, or that's you know managed by these thousands of decentralized computers that nobody owns by the way okay so nobody owns this it's like the analogy i like to give is this so back in the day we had what's called the morse code okay and the morse code allowed us to say boop boop and then it'd go across the copper wire another person would get it and we knew that the boop boop means hello okay now dr morse invented the morse code but once he released it he didn't really control it right it was owned by the network and so somebody said you know what actually boop boop shouldn't mean hello it should be boop 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 then they'd have to convince everybody that uses the morse code to now move to that new thing and such is the same with bitcoin nobody owns it okay it's just an agreed upon set of um, set of rules that allow these transactions to take place so when somebody submits a request it gets picked up by all these computers that are participating in the network and then they all eventually add it to their copy of the ledger in what's called a block okay and they put it on their history of blocks and so you have this whole uh, this whole history of transactions that every single node has a copy of okay so these people because again it's just part of the network like the Morse code these people have no way to change these blocks okay it's impossible it's like you, they have to break the laws of thermodynamics in order to do it so they just can't do it and not only that but they don't have any incentive to do it because their incentive is to verify transactions because when they verify a transaction they get a little reward in the form of Bitcoin okay which is just the uh, currency that's that's it's just what whatever the balance is you could have called it anything but they decide to call it Bitcoin okay so what this system did is basically replaced the banks and I hope that was clear enough but it goes a step further so uh, earlier we drew out the bank here but we also showed that some of the internet companies have a very similar structure well with Ethereum we're using the same exact structure okay but we're applying it more broadly and instead of a single transaction in Bitcoin when you do a transaction the only thing that's included is uh, it's the from address the to address and the amount of Bitcoin you want to exchange and then you can send a little message in like happy birthday or something okay but that's it that's the only thing that's included with Ethereum we add on a new little field here and we call it bytecode okay so you could put in code into your transaction so what you can also do is send bytecode with a special formula whatever and you can create a contract that lives of its own accord and this contract can store ether and it can manipulate ether based on the set of rules that you put in in the bytecode okay so let me give you an example so and this is something by the way that bitcoin just cannot do because bitcoin was the first and it was solving a very simple premise and the very simple premise was how do we have a currency without a bank okay now ethereum says wow they invented this amazing technology why, why don't we use that technology for other things this technology is called a blockchain why don't we use the blockchain for other things like uh, you know you could do stock certificates or you can do you could replace insurance companies you can do car titles on car titles on cars home titles on homes you can do a whole slew of things and not only that but you can replace like things that we haven't even thought of like for example back in 1991 the internet was kind of getting its its wings a little bit in 1995 and then 10 years later new applications started coming out for the internet that the original inventors of the internet had no idea uh, they could there's no way to predict what would happen right they just couldn't they predicted some things like mail order catalogs would be replaced 
and we'd be using email, but they couldn't predict Facebook, they couldn't predict uh, a lot of these other technologies. So the same is true with this. We have this technology that allows us basically to do this. Anytime we have a third party, whether, here's a good example. So this is the government, right? This is the government, you have your little pillars. And then let's say that you want to open up a business. Okay, well, the way that you do it today is you would go and get some forms and then you have this piece of paper and you say, this is gonna be the CEO and then this is gonna be our operating laws. Okay, so your operating laws, you could actually think of as kind of like a program, right? Your laws, you say, we're gonna meet once every four months and we're gonna talk about this, this, and this. And then if this person is no longer the CEO, this person's gonna be the new CEO and you're gonna do all these different things, right? And then you take this program and you give it to the government and the government says, ah, yes, this is the right form, click, and we will enforce these rules that you have set in place. And so that's what the government does in this set for one, I mean, the government is a whole bunch of things, but in, in the case of setting up a business or forming a company, the government will help you enforce the rules that you set. Well, guess what? With Ethereum, we don't need this guy anymore. What we can do is make a contract uh, that lives on the blockchain that says whoever has this key is the CEO, and then you give the person the key and they're the CEO, and you can say, if these five keys vote to have the CEO replaced, then the CEO will be replaced. And you say, you could just program in all sorts of different laws and you can have it backed up by this decentralized blockchain where you don't need a third party. Okay, you, don't, you no longer need a third party. So basically any time in this current uh, civilization that we live in, any time you need a third party to verify something, like a dating agency, right? So you have a dating agency, and you both upload your profiles, whatever, and then this person is the matchmaker. Well, you can theoretically have all this stuff, you can get rid of this middleman, and you can have the blockchain do it, okay? Or what about with Amazon, where you have, they're like, a, they are a vendor, so this person's a seller, this person's a buyer, same with eBay, right? Okay, then they're the matchmaker. Well, you can have all this stuff be decentralized and taken care of in a program. Okay, so it's a really big deal. Now with Ethereum, there's a few parts to it. The first part is just the fundamental core. Okay, we call it Ethereum. But then there's this other thing called Swarm. Okay, and Swarm is basically a storage system. So if you want to think of it as like a decentralized Dropbox, where right now when you go and you have a computer and you say, oh, I want to store it in the cloud, well, your cloud, quote unquote, is really just Dropbox's server or Dropbox's fancy computer. Okay, and then what you do is you upload your stuff and it's just living on Dropbox's computer. And then when you download it again, you, you just download it from there. Well, with Swarm, what it does is this is a protocol that interacts with Ethereum that allows you to, when you upload something to the network, it's broken up into a whole bunch of different pieces and it's all identified correctly and then it shoots off and it just resides in a whole bunch of computers all around the world that are participating in this network. And they can't actually read it because it's just a little division of it. So the only person that can pull it out is the person with the right keys, which would be you. Okay, and so then you can pull it out and it grabs it from all these different computers. Okay, so this is called Swarm. This part of it is, you can think of it as the hard drive or storage. Okay. Another part of it is messaging. Well, we, we don't really have to go into all this stuff, but there's, if Ethereum is like the processor of the computer, then you have a bunch of different types of pieces in the computer. The hard drive for storage, uh, if you want to interact with different um, parts. You could have a messaging system and that, this is what this is called. It's called, um, it's called Whisper. No, sorry, it's called Casper. 
or maybe it's called Whisper, I forget. Okay, but Casper is the messaging system. So if you want to message different objects, and then we also have this other thing called Mist. And you can think of Mist is the screen, the display on your computer. And what Mist is the user interface that allows you to interact with contracts and allows you to access these other features. Okay, so anyways, that is a quick introduction to Ethereum. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm sure I could do a better job, but uh, I don't know, I'm just talking to myself here. So if you have any questions, go ahead and leave a question, and maybe I'll do a new updated version of this video. Okay, thank you.